morning. If you have your Bibles, you turn to the book of Exodus as we begin our series working through this book. Today we are going to be in chapter 1, looking at verses 1 through 22. As you are turning there, I will tell you a a story that Elie Wiesel tells. Um, Elie Wiesel was a a Holocaust survivor during World War II. Uh, He was in a concentration camp there in in Germany. Uh, He tells a story about uh, this time where there were three uh, prisoners that were there at the concentration camp with him uh, who were caught hoarding weapons. Um, and of course, we know the, the cruelties of the, the Germans onto the, the Jewish people. Um, so they were, were punished. The Eli Wiesel says uh, they gather the, the camp together and the three prisoners are, are led out and they're going to be hanged. Um, so the, as they're setting up the gallows and the three prisoners are, are heading towards them, um, Wiesel says there's a kind of a hush that goes uh, along the people. As they're about to witness uh, a murder, basically. Um, and in the middle, midst of that hush, somebody yells out, where is God? Um, it's, it's still quiet. The, the Germans carry on with the, the, the punishment and the, the execution. Uh, but one of the, the victims, um, it, it, it takes him a little longer uh, to pass away. Um, it's, it's, it's kind of a gruesome thing. He's, he's hanging on longer, and it's not an instant, an instant death. Uh, and as the, the rest of the camp is watching in horror as this, um, as this one is still hanging on, uh, the same guy yells out, where is God now? Uh, in our story today in Exodus chapter 1, this is a, an instance where the Israelites would have cried out, where is God? Uh, later in the book, they're going to cry out to God. Uh, we just have the situation here in Exodus 1. This understanding that this oppression that's happening, the cruelty that's going to happen to the Israelites that's happening, might lead them to say, where is God? Has God left us? And this question, this where is God, has God left us, leads us to understand that everyone needs redemption. That everyone needs redemption. As we work through the first chapter of Exodus, we're going to see this fact, that everyone needs redemption. Redemption. And before we get into reading, I'm going to read it a section at a time as we work through uh, the, the sections of, of chapter 1. So we're not going to read the whole thing at the same time. We're just going to go a section at a time. But before we start reading, we need a little bit of, of context. So the book of Exodus is the second book of the Pentateuch, which is a fancy word, a Hebrew word for the first five books of the Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Now Moses wrote, these first five books, and they are meant to be taken as a whole. In our translations in Exodus, uh, mine begins with, these are the names of the sons of Israel. But there's a word that's not translated in most of your uh, translations that starts with and. That and there signifies that this is like chapter 2. If Genesis is chapter 1, then Exodus is continuing on this story. It's, it's like a chapter 2 of the continuing narrative. So what happens at the end of Genesis? At the end of Genesis, we have the the familiar story of Joseph. We won't go through the whole story of Joseph, but Joseph, through trials and events in his life, ends up in Egypt where he is responsible for um, basically taking care of the nation in the midst of a famine. And this famine spreads throughout all the land and the surrounding areas, including the area where his family is living. Now, his family... Uh, makes their way, eventually makes their way down to Egypt. And Joseph takes care of his family. Uh, this happens over like, 13 chapters at the, the end of Genesis. Joseph takes care of his family. Uh, they end up settling there. So now we have Jacob, Joseph's dad, who's also called Israel, uh, and all of the, the, the sons and their wives and kids. And it says, as we're about to read, it says that there were 70 people. They settle at the end of Genesis. They're living in Egypt. It provides kind of this context to what's about to happen here in the book of Exodus. There we see, when they get to Exodus, when we get to chapter 1, we see God's people multiplied. Let's start reading here in verse 1. It's, These are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob, each with his household, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, 
Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. All the descendants of Jacob were 70 persons. Joseph was already in Egypt. Then Joseph died, and all his brothers and all that generation. But the people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong, so that the land was filled with them. The beginning of the book of Exodus shows the sons of Israel. These are, this is Jacob. Jacob is Israel. His name changes in uh, Genesis 32. They've settled in Egypt. This will be the last time that this term, the, the sons of Israel, you see there in verse 1, uh, will be used to describe a family before it soon begins to describe an entire nation. Verse 5 tells us that this family included 70 persons, 70 people. But then the narrative speeds up. We get kind of Joseph died, everybody else died. But the people have multiplied. The generations that we had read about at the end of Genesis uh, have moved on. We've got new generations that have come in, and this nation has spread out. These younger generations have kept the the creation mandate. Now, the creation mandate is back in Genesis 3, when God says, uh, or back in Genesis 1, when God says to to Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply. We get the same language here in verse 7, but the people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong. This word for for being fruitful and multiplying is the word for, it, it carries this connotation of swarm. Right? When we think of, of swarm, uh, we think of bugs and insects. Uh, most of the time, if you're in July or August, I think of mosquitoes, um, humans hated insect. Uh, but think about people. Right? If you have a view, a, a view of a nation like India, um, India's population comes out to uh, 1,202 people per square mile. That's a lot of people crammed into a, a small amount of space. That is what it looks like to swarm. You get a a picture of of humans swarming. So in Israel, nearly a hundred years later after Joseph has died, the people have expanded. The nation is is swarming. The Israelites are a force. The land is full. As it says at the end of of verse 7. This is fulfilling this covenant to Abraham. Remember God promise to Abraham in, in Genesis chapter 12 that I will make you a great nation. Kings will come from you. I will, I will bless your people. Well, God has kept his promise. This, from Abraham and Sarah, who had a child in their late 90s, uh, early 100s, which is not something that we, we hear of anymore, uh, God has made this great nation and multiplied his people. We see his favor. We see his blessing on the people. God's people have grown from a a fairly large family to the size of a a small nation. It's evidence of God's blessing, that God keeps his promises, that God is faithful, that God has not left them. We see the language of creation as God connects what's about to happen in Exodus to what took place in the beginning. This God of creation, just hold on to this for a few more chapters later, the God of creation will soon become God the Savior. But we need to see that Israel... We need to see first that Israel needs saving. God's people may have multiplied, but they're they're about to run into trouble here in in Egypt as they have overstayed their their welcome. Moses then tells us that God's about God's people oppressed, starting in verse 8. God's people oppressed. Moses writes, Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, Behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. And if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. They built for Pharaoh's store cities, Pithom and Ramses. But the more that they were oppressed, the more they multiplied, and the more they spread abroad. And the Egyptians were in dread of the people of Israel. So they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in all kinds of work in the field. In all their work, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. In verse 8, we have a regime change in the the land of Egypt. It says we have a a new king. There arose a new king. Now notice something, that this king is not named. We'll come back to why that might be significant later, but just tuck it away for right now. This this king is not named. He has no name. Then it tells us that he doesn't know Joseph. 
Now, either this is out of ignorance, he just had never heard of Joseph and Joseph's family, uh, but, or it's uh, out of willful ignorance, where he's choosing not to know Joseph, because he just wants to put the Israelites out and not, not deal with them. But he comes, and he comes to his people, and he, he, he's afraid. He says, Behold, the, the people of Israel are, are too many. They're too mighty. Uh, so he devises a plan, this plan to, to stymie the growth of the, the Israelite people. Pharaoh was afraid that Israel was going to grow too numerous to control, too mighty to, to handle. And Pharaoh's first plan then is to force the Israelites into hard labor. Now, this is common in this time. Forced labor is, is common, especially at the hands of the Egyptians. They, they built the, the pyramids this way. They built the Nile canals this way. They're, they're no strangers to forcing another nation to work for them. Pharaoh's plan is to oppress the people so that they don't multiply, but remain a viable workforce for him. So he's got people to build the stuff he wants them to build. We see the the language of oppression throughout the the next few verses. This is not just a uh, hiring of employees. This is a forced labor of slavery, the Egyptians, at the hands of the Egyptians. Their language throughout the next few verses, Moses uses words like afflict, and heavy burdens, oppressed, ruthlessly, bitter. Pharaoh's doing this because he doesn't want them to rise up, attack, and leave Egypt, which is kind of what happens anyways. His, his plan is, is thwarted. His plan then is for them to build a couple store cities, Pithom and, and Ramses. And we get these names, but these are details that, that put the setting of this narrative somewhere like 1299, 1225 B.C. But notice the verse that comes after, that phrase that comes after they name the cities. In verse 12, the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied, and the more they spread abroad. Pharaoh's plan is to come down hard on the, the, the Israelites, and instead of thwarting God's plan, God continues to succeed. God continues to multiply the people, to spread the people out. His, his people and his plans cannot be stopped. Attempts to control the people of God are always done in vain. Despite the oppression, the Israelites continue to multiply. And thus, the, the Egyptians were afraid. God's people were swarming as they were designed to do from creation. Before long, the Egyptians would need to up the, the severity of the, the oppression. We'll get to that in a second. God's people have been blessed by God in their multiplication, but now they're, they're under oppression in Egypt. You can, you can see the, the progression over many years where they're saved by God's hand uh, as, as he uses Joseph uh, to make sure that the line of Israel is preserved, that they have enough food to eat, that they have somewhere to live in Egypt as the people are multiplying with somewhere to live. But now it might feel like God has left, that God is no longer there. They are under oppression in Egypt, and this will come to be nothing new for God's people. You read through the Old Testament, and uh, the world is consistently against the message of God and of, against His people. And even into the Old Testament, Jesus tells His followers, hey, you would basically be well to understand that you're going to be persecuted. You're going to be oppressed. The oppression continues to increase in severity. But soon we're going to see the response of some of the, the Hebrew women. If we've seen God's people oppressed, next we see God's people standing. Starting in verse 15. Moses writes, Then the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra and the other Pua, When you serve as midwife to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a son, you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but let the male children live. So the king of Egypt called the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this? And let the male children live. The midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dwelt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and grew very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, Every son that is born to the Hebrews you shall cast into the Nile, but you shall let every daughter live. When Pharaoh's first plan doesn't work, he, he enlists the help of, uh, of a couple of Hebrew midwives in a, in a more sinister plan to, to oppress the Israelites. We still have no name for the Egyptian king, right? but now we have names for these Hebrew midwives. 
We have this Pharaoh who's trying to make a name for himself, who's building great buildings and, and trying to, to be famous throughout all of history. He has no name in all of Scripture. And then in the rest of Scripture, we don't have anything else about Shifra and Pua, but we have names of the two women who stood up to the evil of the Egyptians. Shifra and Pua, names here and details of the store cities earlier mean that we're dealing with genuine historical tradition. This is not a parable. No one made this story up in order to, to teach us a lesson. This actually happened to God's people. Pharaoh's instructions then to the midwives are when they go about doing their, their duties, they are to kill every son that is born, but allow the daughters to live. Now imagine the, the terror in the, uh, in the Egyptians at this point. My nine months of of joy and expectation of waiting for your child turns into nine months of terror, of fear. There are no ultrasounds at this time. There's no way to know what the gender of the baby is going to be before the baby is born. The whole time you're, you're hoping, at this point you're hoping that you're having a daughter so that your baby can live. The excitement of multiplication, the, the joy of fulfill, fulfilling God's commands to be fruitful and multiply has been taken away through, through Pharaoh's plan. But the midwives feared God, as it says in verse 17. It's an important contrast. We've, uh, up, up until this point, we've got the Egyptians able to oppress the people and, and, and continuing new uh, methods. And though the people are, are multiplying, nobody has really stood up until now. The midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them. Pharaoh is intending to slow the growth of the Israelites through this state-sponsored genocide. But these Hebrew midwives stand up to this evil. They stand up to this oppression. This isn't the only time that we have a, a state-sponsored genocide in Scripture. Or later in, in the narrative of the Bible, in, in the book of Matthew, uh, Herod is going to sponsor something similar, where he's trying to kill all of the, the baby boys that are born who are two years and under in, a, in an effort to try to kill Jesus before he can come and, and take his throne. But neither Pharaoh nor Herod can stand in the way of God's plan. Matter of fact, neither Pharaoh nor Herod nor any ruler or leader or anyone on earth can stand in the way of God's plan. God is truly an unstoppable force. God's will always comes to fruition. God never deviates from His plan. God, God never has to, to make a change of plans because something has come up. God always accomplishes what he sets out to do. God, or Jesus still came to be the Messiah for his people. and We're going to see Pharaoh's plan thwarted next week with, with the coming of Moses. The Hebrew midwives come and they fear God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them. They tell him, uh, the, the Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women, for they are, are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. What a reputation to have, uh, to be a, a vigorous child deliverer, uh, as, the, as the Hebrew women are. But in this, it says that God dwelt, dealt well with the midwives. The people multiplied and grew very strong. To be faithful to the Lord is to, uh, to, or to reap God's blessing is what happens when we're faithful to the Lord. It doesn't always happen in the, the ways that we think it's going to happen. It doesn't always um, occur in, in riches and earthly blessings. But to be faithful to God is to receive His blessing. They fear the Lord more than they fear Pharaoh. And their reverence for life sprang from their reverence for God. In living out this principle, it's, it's from Acts chapter 5, verses, verse 29. I'll, I'll flip over here and read it so that we understand what, what's happening. Uh, it says, but Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than man. We must obey God rather than man. The, the Hebrew midwives have originated this. The, this is the, their first instance. That they're fearing God rather than what Pharaoh can do to them. They go back to Pharaoh, back to the king, and say, we didn't do what you told us to do as 
as slave women in this nation. We, we defied your order. It takes boldness. We see that God deals well with them. That God continues to uh, provide and protect and take care. In the midst of this trial, in the midst of this oppression and, and tragedy and, and, and cruelty on the, the behalf of the, the Egyptians, God has not left. God is still present. He's still rewarding faithfulness. He's still active with His people. We see in verse 20, God dwelt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and grew very strong. Those are key words, for God is still there. The people still multiplied. The Israelites then, they continued to grow. As the people multiplied and grew very strong, God gave them families, to the, gave the families to the midwives. And then Pharaoh doubles down in verse 22. Pharaoh commanded all his people, Every son that is born to the Hebrews you shall cast into the Nile, but you shall let every daughter live. Now it's no longer the responsibility of the Hebrew midwives. It is the responsibility of every Egyptian. If you see a, a Hebrew son walking around, you are to throw him into the river. That's the end of the chapter. It doesn't wrap up on a happy note. It doesn't resolve. It ends on a sour note that all Hebrew sons are to be tossed into the Nile River. We're left with the tension of how God will make this right. And sometimes we have to sit in this tension, this understanding that God has promised redemption, God has promised to be with His people, but right now it doesn't quite look like He is. So how do we take this? How do we take Exodus chapter 1? What do we do looking at this story? When we look at this passage, what are we supposed to take from it? First of all, this is part of a story. All right? we, we have to read the Bible as a whole in order to see the grand narrative of what God is doing. Recognize that the story here in chapter 1 is building towards a high point later in the book and is a, a chapter in the story of the Israelites. It's continuing on the story that's already started. We do an injustice to Scripture when we just scan it looking for things for us to do. It's not an instruction manual. It's not just a list of, uh, hey, go do this, don't do that, do this, don't do that. It's a story of, of God redeeming His people. When we see the whole story and what God is doing with His people, we can then move to apply. So in that vein, we, we see, we've already touched on it quite a bit, we see the faith of the the Hebrew midwives, as they stand up to evil, and we see their, their reverence for life. Though the passage is not a, an explicitly pro-life passage, we can understand that the one who values God is going to be one who values life, and is going to serve God above all. We can look at the example of the Hebrew midwives standing up to evil in our world. God is a God of justice. God is not on the side of the oppressor, but on the side of the oppressed. God cares how we look after the, the least of these. We can see the faith of the, the Hebrew midwives as they stand up to the, the, the Pharaoh with the boldness that God has given to them. And as we, we mentioned, when Pharaoh wants to be remembered, we don't have his name. Instead, we have the names of the ones who are faithful to God. God is a God of justice, and His people should mirror His heart. He remains on the, the side of justice for the oppressed. But then last and most significant, we see this need for redemption. This is what, this is what is, the scene is being set, that the Israelites are going to need saving. They're enslaved, they're oppressed. The Egyptians are cruel towards them. In our time, we aren't in, enslaved by another nation like the Egyptians, but those not in Christ are enslaved to their sin, as it says in, in Romans 6. Everyone, no matter what they have done, is in need of redemption. There is not a soul on earth who doesn't need to be redeemed by God. When I was in, uh, I think, early high school area, my, my brother had a, uh, so he's five years younger than me, he had a, a friend that lived down the road from us. Uh, so we went over, and his, his friend had a pool. So uh, his, friend, his friend's name was Ethan. Uh, Ethan invited me and Colin to come uh, hang out at the pool and swim um, a, a, that afternoon. Colin could not swim at this point. 
Um, he can now, so don't hold that against him. Uh, but Colin could not swim at this point. So he's playing in the, the shallow end. He and Ethan, I don't, they're playing basketball or, or throwing the football or something. Uh, and, and everyone knows this, right? In a pool, it's flat in the shallow end. And to go to the, the deep end, it's just kind of like there's a, a, a ramp and then it kind of drops off. So Colin steps. I don't know if he's going for a ball or, or, or what he's doing, but he steps. And he's now in a depth he cannot, uh, he can't reach anymore. Uh, so Colin starts flailing. I mean, he's, uh, he's flapping his arms, trying to keep his head above the water. He can't swim. I'm in the water. Um, so I'm, I, I was like, I got to go get him. Um, so I swim over to go get him. Um, and I, I can swim. I can keep myself alive. <laughs> not, not, a, not a swim team, not going not gonna to be a lifeguard anytime. Uh, but I, I can keep myself alive. I get over there to, sw- to get him, and I, I wrap my arm around him, and he pushes down on my head. Um, and at this point, um, I'm, I'm fighting him to get him to stop while he's holding me underwater. Uh, I don't know how long it takes. Um, it's longer than you want to be underwater fighting somebody else. Uh, but he's pushing and pushing, trying to keep himself up over the water while I'm trying to get him, and I'm, I'm just flailing at this point. I can feel like the, the, the stress level is going up. Like, I need somebody to help us. At, the, at some point... Colin gets off of my back, uh, and um, I, I, there's relief. I can come back up. I can breathe again. Um, and Ethan had grabbed a pool noodle, and he's standing on the edge, and he gives it to Colin, and Colin gets off of me. All right. In that instance, if it had continued, there would be quite a tragic story because uh, I, could, I couldn't get Colin off of me. Colin couldn't swim. All right. We needed saving. Somebody on the outside, couldn't save ourselves. Everyone is in that position. Because of their sin, everyone through everywhere throughout history is one of two types of people. Those who know Jesus as their Lord and Savior and those who don't. And those who know Jesus as their Lord and Savior um, already know that they need this redemption, that they need this salvation. They need to be saved from their sins. Those who don't know, it is uh, our responsibility to tell them that they need Jesus. We must be honest about our sin. We must recognize where we would be outside of the work of the Lord. Our sin would ultimately separate us from God for eternity. And our, our current sin as, as believers puts a strain on that relationship with, the God, with, with God. For the Israelites in Exodus, they have to hope that God is going to do something. We're at the end of, of chapter 1, and at this point, the end of chapter 1 is every son who is born to the Hebrews is cast into the Nile. They have to hope that God is going to redeem them, that, that God is going to save them. But we don't have to hope. For us, there's an answer. We're not, we're not looking at the end of chapter 1 going, man, what's going to happen to us because of our sin? We have an answer for our sin problem. His name is Jesus. We have a need for redemption, and Christ satisfies that need. Through believing in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, we can have our sins forgiven and covered. We can be given life. We can be saved out of the death that we deserve because of our sin. On a daily basis, our surrendering to Jesus and trusting in the truth of the gospel allows us to live freely as a a follower of Christ. So as we read Exodus 1, see your need for redemption. Trust in the the saving work of Jesus to satisfy that need. Both as saving you from your sin and and sanctifying you through His grace. It sets up this story in Exodus, this great redemption that we'll see later on. But feel the tension. The fact that we are sinful. The fact that we need Jesus. Jesus. The fact that we can't save ourselves. And worship the Lord for the salvation He has worked in your life. The beginning of Exodus is both a, a continuation from the story in Genesis and the rising action, moving towards God's great, God, God's great redemption. Moses is setting the scene for God to do a great work. But at this point in time, the Israelites may be asking, where is God? Why has he left us? This first chapter ends on a a somber note, but it highlights an important fact for us. We are all, like the Israelites, in need of redemption. 
in need of saving. We're dead in our sins and we cannot revive ourselves. So this morning, see your sin. See your need for redemption, your need for forgiveness. And believers, worship the Lord for his kindness to you and salvation. This is what drives us. It's our knowledge that God has saved us. That he has forgiven us of our sins. That we can be reconciled to the God of the universe. Worship the Lord for what he has done. For unbelievers, for those who have never given their lives to Christ. Repent of your sin this morning. Cry out to the Lord for forgiveness. Because God continues to save. God continues to redeem those who know they are in need. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word this morning. Thank you that you have not left us or forgotten us. God, that you continue to save. God, we pray that you would uh, work salvation in those in here who have never believed. God, we pray that you would work salvation in those who are not here today that, that we know and are witnessing to. God, we pray that you would help us to see our sin. Remind us of our need for redemption and the fact that you have saved us, that you have offered us forgiveness. God, I pray that you stir our hearts to worship. God, we thank you for loving us. We thank you for uh, gathering us here this morning. And we thank you for this time that we can worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. You come this morning as the Lord leads.